Welcome back. We are now starting our third presentation of the day, COVID-19 and Single Audits, Part 1, with Katherine Good. As a reminder, this session will have three polling questions. Attendees must respond to these polling questions within the allotted time in order to receive CPE credit for the presentation. If you encounter any issues responding to the polls, please send your answer in the questions pane and we will document them for your CPE credit. Credits will only be earned for sessions intended in their entirety. With that, I would like to welcome Catherine. Thank you, Laura. I appreciate that. And I appreciate everyone joining us for an afternoon of single audits. I'll introduce myself briefly. Move on to the next slide here. My name is Catherine Good, and I'm a senior manager in PYA's audit and assurance practice. I work out of our corporate headquarters, which are located here in Knoxville, Tennessee, and I spend about 80% of my time working with hospitals and healthcare systems on their financial statement audits. And so, with that, does come the opportunity to work on several different single audits throughout the year. Certainly with all of the federal dollars that have come out from COVID-19 relief funding, that has kicked up for both our firm and then certainly um, out at several of our client organizations. Uh, so on the agenda today, we'll be talking through, excuse me, we'll start with talking through the basics of uniform guidance audits and kind of the what's and when's and why's of those. We'll spend a little bit of time talking through how to prepare for a uniform guidance audit, which will hopefully be helpful for anything anyone going through this process for the first time. And then we'll spend some time talking through internal controls and how those are governed by the uniform guidance. So we'll kick it off with discussing those basics of uniform guidance audits. So as we're all very well aware, our federal government is spending hundreds of billions uh, into the trillions of taxpayer dollars every year in awards to non-federal entities. Most of these dollars are going to state and local governments who are then passing some of those funds on to other recipients, uh, but some of it is going directly to colleges and universities or to nonprofit organizations like a hospital or a healthcare system. And so just for context, I actually pulled the most recent single audit for the state of Tennessee for their fiscal year into June 30 of 2021. And just for some scope here, they had received 24 billion in federal awards just in fiscal 2021. And of that, about 3.3 billion had been passed on to other recipients. And on that note, a federal award can take lots of different forms. You'll hear us mention grants quite a bit throughout um, part one and part two of this presentation, which Trevor will be leading part two. Uh, but federal awards can be either a grant, a loan, an insurance, a direct payment. There's lots of kind of forms and functionality of those. And so with all of these federal dollars that are kind of floating around our nation, the audit is really the primary tool that our government has to make sure that those funds are being spent the way they need to be. And with that, you know, our government's not necessarily asking to audit out every last dollar of grant funds. Uh, they've kind of set the threshold that any entity that has expended more than $750,000 in federal awards in a given year, those organizations would be required to obtain a single audit or a uniform guidance audit. The emphasis here is on the amount of federal awards that have been expended in a given year. It's separate from the amount of grants that had been awarded or the actual cash that came in the door. The goal here is to really match up the actual award activities with those expenditures from a timing perspective. Throughout part one and part two of our discussion, there will be several exceptions and differences that are caused by COVID, just like anything else in our lives these days. Uh, but there is a little bit of a difference in the expenditure versus receipt aspect 
for those CARES Act provider relief funds. So Trevor will be sharing a little bit more about that. Another thing I'll mention is that you might hear Trevor and I use the term single audit or uniform guidance audit kind of interchangeably today. Um, and what we mean by either of those terms um, is the term single audit is coming from what's called the Single Audit Act, which is mentioned here on this slide. And that was legislation that basically allowed for a non-federal entity to have their financial statement audit and their compliance audit with federal award programs to be combined into one engagement with one large reporting package. So it's a single audit that's covering both financial statements and federal award compliance. The uniform guidance is the actual regulations that are implementing the Single Audit Act. And so the overall goal of the Single Audit Act was to streamline and really reduce the audit burden for non-federal entities. Uh, I'll let everyone make up their own minds as to whether or not that was actually effective, but either way, that is the legislation that we're working with. So the overall goal of a uniform guidance audit is first off, the auditor will be issuing their opinion as to whether or not the financial statements have been presented fairly, either under generally accepted accounting principles or under governmental accounting standards, depending on the nature of the organization. The auditor will also express their opinion about whether the schedule of expenditures of federal awards or the CFA, whether that's presented fairly in relation to those financial statements and footnotes. And then lastly, there is the compliance audit for federal award programs. And so with this piece of the audit, um, your auditor is not necessarily going to be testing every dollar of every award program. Uh, they're gonna make, make a selection of awards um, of programs that are considered to be a major award program. And so that major program determination can be based on the dollar amount of an award, or maybe the dollar amount of that award as a percentage of total federal awards. There's also some risk components since some programs do just inherently have a higher level of risk. Uh, there may be some requirements from the actual awarding agency to test a program as a major program, or just really some overall entity risks can play into this as well. Uh, for an organization that's maybe going through its first single audit, or maybe had some control issues or non-compliance issues in past years, that could lead to a higher number of award programs being selected as a major program. And so the auditor will be testing the unique compliance requirements that are specific to each of these awards. You know, most programs are gonna have restrictions over the use of the dollars. There could be reporting requirements that have to be met. There might be eligibility standards for program participants. So the grant award will indicate what those are, as well as something called the compliance supplement that's issued every year by the Office of Management and Budget, I'm just kind of listing out all of the major award programs that are out there and what types of compliance requirements apply to each of those. From a timing standpoint, Typically, the deadline for submitting the audit package is nine months after an organization's year end. Um, here's another COVID exception. There was a six month extension of that timeline for fiscal year ended through June 30 of 2021. At this time, there have not been any further extensions. We're not aware of any others and don't expect any further extensions to be coming along. And the requirement is that the single audit be performed every year that the organization has hit the $750,000 expenditure threshold. There are a few very specific criteria that some organizations meet, um, and those organizations only have to go through the single audit process every other year, uh, but those are pretty unique and specific circumstances. So we won't spend any time going through that today. When we refer to submitting the reporting package here on this slide, 
that's the process of actually uploading the reporting package, which we'll go through the components of that on the next slide, to what's called the Federal Audit Clearinghouse. And the Federal Audit Clearinghouse is a web-based platform that's distributing those reporting packages to federal agencies and sub-agencies so that they can monitor compliance. And it's also available to the public. And it serves as a repository for all of these audit reporting packages that have been uploaded over a pretty long period of time. So there's a lot of historical data out there as well. We've listed here all of the different components of the Uniform Guidance Audit Reporting Package. Um, so in this long list of things, there's three different auditors' reports and then several schedules that are required to be prepared by management. Many of us are familiar with the first item, and that's just the standard financial statement auditor's report on whether the financial statements and footnotes are materially correct under US GAAP or governmental accounting standards. And then also it's gonna include the auditor's opinion as to whether the CFA has been presented fairly in relation to those financial statements. The next component is the audited financial statements and footnotes, which are the responsibility of management. The remaining items on the list here are all pretty unique and specific to the uniform guidance audit process. Uh, we have our second auditor's report here. That's the auditor's report on internal controls over financial reporting and on compliance. This report is going to be describing the scope of the auditor's testing of compliance with laws and regulations and the scope of the testing that they performed over internal control over financial reporting. Typically, the auditor is not going to be expressing any kind of opinion or providing any assurance about these items unless you've specifically engaged them to do that. But in this report, if the auditor had encountered any significant deficiencies or material weaknesses in internal control over financial reporting or any major instances of non-compliance, it would be included here in this report. Uh, so to call back to that State of Tennessee report that I had looked at, um, their state auditor did include one significant deficiency in internal control over financial reporting and one instance of non-compliance. So, Certainly not ideal, but I guess I was glad as a Tennessee resident that it was only one of each. Um, certainly could have been a lot worse there. The next component is the CFA, and this is the schedule that's listing all of the federal award programs that had expenditures during the year under audit. It'll list the name of the program, the amount that was expended, and several other pieces of information that Trevor will be going into um, in a deep dive in part two of this presentation. And this is a really critical starting point to the entire single audit process. Uh, this is the document that your auditors will be using as they're going through that major grant program determination that we talked about. Um, so it is important that you know, this be as complete and accurate as possible so that they have a good starting point to work with. There's also a few short footnotes to a CFA. Uh, this is just providing some qualitative information about the accounting policies and the presentation of the CFA. The next item here, the schedule of findings and question costs, uh, probably should have been in bold font or in huge letters or something because it's really the most critical piece of the package, I would say. Um, it's kind of condensing and summarizing all of the auditor's results into one section of the reporting package. So this is where um, it will list the auditor's opinion on the financial statements, if the auditor had encountered any instances of material non-compliance with laws and regulations, if there were any major deficiencies or material weaknesses in internal controls over compliance for the major programs that were tested, It'll indicate which grants had specifically been tested as a major program, uh, which for the state of Tennessee was more than 20, so certainly a lot of work done there. And then any major control findings that came out of the financial statement audit would also be included here. 
um, you know, those significant deficiencies or material weaknesses in internal control over financial reporting. Uh, just like the name suggests, this would also be where any major findings, fraud, question costs, potential waste or abuse, uh, those would all be disclosed in this section. So definitely packing a lot of critical information into a few pages here. The next item, the corrective action plan, is the responsibility of management. And it's only necessary if there are audit findings in the current year. This is management drafting and documenting their plan to correct any findings noted by the auditor, or if they've already done so, indicating that as well. The state of Tennessee did have a few pages of this in their single audit. The schedule of prior audit findings, the next item here, would only be required if there had been audit findings in the prior year, so certainly wouldn't apply to any first year entities. Um, for any finding that had been fully corrected in the current year or maybe just didn't apply, uh, there wouldn't be much to draft or document here. But in the instance that a finding had been only partially corrected or no action had been taken, management would be responsible for documenting here why that finding had reoccurred and again the actions that they planned to take or had taken to prevent it from becoming an ongoing issue. Uh, so the state of Tennessee did have a few other pages of information on this section as well. The last item here is our final and third auditor's report, the report on compliance for major federal programs. This report is where the auditor expresses their opinion as to whether the auditee had complied with all of the federal statutes and regulations and terms and conditions for the awards that were considered to be a major program. Um, it also would describe what the auditor did as far as internal control over compliance for those major programs, and typically would indicate that the auditor was not performing enough testing to be able to express an opinion or provide assurance. Uh, but again, any significant deficiencies or material weaknesses would be reported here. And so the state of Tennessee did receive a qualified opinion on this in 2021. Uh, there was one major program where one of the compliance requirements uh, had not been met to the auditor's satisfaction, uh, and there were some significant deficiencies and material weaknesses noted. So certainly a little bit of room for improvement um, could be used at our state. Uh, although I did look on the Federal Audit Clearinghouse website and there were hundreds of other organizations that had qualified opinions here, so at least we're in good company uh, for whatever that's worth. So all of this information is consolidated and combined into one reporting package. It'll be uploaded to the Federal Audit Clearinghouse, like I'd mentioned, along with something called the Data Collection Form, which is an Excel workbook that's really just summarizing a lot of this other audit information and part of it is prepared by the auditee, and part of it is the responsibility of the auditor. And so I'd mentioned that um, these audit reports are available to federal awarding agencies, the public can access them. Um, and so you know, depending on the results of the audit, you know, if there's major non-compliance, any fraud or significant control issues, there can be some pretty big impacts to an organization. Uh, there could be the requirement to actually repay some of your federal award money. You could be suspended from receiving future federal awards. Your organization might be categorized as what's called a high-risk auditee, and that really plays into that major program determination that we talked about earlier it can lead to a larger number of programs being selected as major programs, which leads to more work for your auditor, which leads to a higher audit fee, and certainly more work for your internal team as they're responding to audit requests and answering audit questions. So certainly a bit of a burden there. There's some reputational risk involved here as well, since these types of audit findings are public information. So it's kind of out on the web for anyone to see and access. 
and really in a worst case scenario and there's instances of intentional fraud intentional waste or abuse there can be some significant civil lawsuits that are coming out of that or criminal prosecution i had seen an example where a nonprofit organization had received millions of dollars in awards to benefit children and those funds had been used very inappropriately to pay for someone's wedding reception for some house construction for a plasma tv which this must have been a few years ago and so this person actually had to serve some jail time so um, certainly want to take all of these things seriously and now we're at our oh, excuse me laura we're at our first polling question Thank you. Our first polling question is, has your organization ever been subject to a single audit? Yes, no, or I'm not sure. Remember, you must fill out the polling question in order to receive CPE credit. You will have 30 seconds to answer. Thank you for participating in our poll. Now I'll hand it back over to Catherine. Thank you, Laura, and thank you everyone for participating. I'll just have a spoiler alert that all of our polling questions will be hard hitters just like that one, so I hope everyone's ready. And on that topic, we'll switch gears now and spend a little bit of time talking through some good strategies for how you can prepare for a uniform guidance audit. So at your end, um, you know, right when you're getting ready to actually work with your auditors on the process, uh, I guess first that you would wanna just coordinate a good time to devote resources to preparing for the audit. You wanna be mindful of that nine month deadline, but also find a time that works well for both your internal team and your auditor to actually you know, buckle down and focus on getting the audit done. And so once you've coordinated that piece of it, uh, you'll want to certainly gather and summarize all of your federal award information like an award contract or an award not notification um, and work with both the grant team and the accounting team will be involved in this to have a good understanding of what's been awarded and what's been expended you'll want to make sure that you have your financial records all gathered together these are going to be what supports all those expenditures of federal awards and also support any type of financial or performance reports that maybe have been prepared for your awards and you'll use those financial records to prepare your first draft of the SEPA. I'll mention again that it is important that this be as accurate and complete as possible and then certainly it would need to reconciled to the financial statements since that's part of what your auditor will be expressing an opinion on. Throughout this single audit process, there will be a lot of emphasis on policies and procedures uh, um, as they relate to internal controls. And so you know, this really makes sense given that these are taxpayer dollars that an organization has been entrusted with. So you do wanna make sure that there are good controls over where those dollars are and how they're being managed. Um, so to the extent that you have written policies and procedures of that nature, you'll want to review them and make sure that they're updated for any changes that have occurred um, since you last looked at them. If there isn't anything written here, uh, you would want to actually draft up your internal control documentation, which we'll spend some time on this here in a bit, um, just making sure you've documented in good detail what type of control activity is in place, who's responsible for performing it and how often, what types of documents and reports would be used for that, and any type of corrective action that might need to take place if an error is identified. And as you're going through that process, um, you certainly wanna make sure that there is good documentary evidence that all of these controls are operating the way you've expected them to be. Uh, so that could be a reviewer sign off or just showing someone's review um, and approval of a piece of information and then certainly don't hesitate to reach out to your auditor if 
um, any of their requested information isn't clear or if you're you know, having any trouble with the SEPA process or anything, anything else, you know, they should be able to help you with that process. There's also a lot that can be done throughout the year to help make the audit process go a little bit more smoothly and hopefully be less painful. Uh, one thing would be to stay on top of the latest changes and developments. And in this time of COVID, there's a lot more than usual. So attending webinars like this one today, or looking at government websites and publications, like some of the information that comes from the Office of Management and Budget, uh, that can be helpful to make sure that you're staying on top of what type of compliance requirements apply to your organization. You would certainly want to make sure that you've reviewed and gotten on top of any problem areas in advance. Uh, kind of a good starting point for this would be looking at prior year audit findings and making sure that not only have those findings been addressed, uh, but there's also documentation and evidence to show what was done to address the finding, since your auditor is going to be responsible for performing follow-up procedures on prior year audit findings. You'll want to make sure that you've investigated and reviewed policies and procedures throughout your organization, you know, not just in accounting and not just in grant management, to make sure all of those are compliant with the terms of federal awards. So procurement policies are coming to mind here on this one. And then certainly throughout the year, your auditor can help with any questions or concerns, especially if you're getting new awards that maybe you're not as familiar with. And then also throughout the year in real time, if you're uh, drafting your procedure documentation and your control information, uh, that can be helpful to make sure that that's getting updated throughout the year in real time instead of having to wait until year end and kind of think through everything that's been done. So with that, we're moving on to our next polling question. So I'll kick it to Laura. Thank you. Our second polling question is, is your organization currently in the process of completing a single audit? Yes, no, or not sure? Remember, you must fill out the polling question in order to receive CPE credit. You'll have 30 seconds to answer. Thank you for participating in our poll. Now I'll hand it back over to Catherine. Thank you, Laura. All right, so two down and one to go with our polling questions. We'll spend the rest of our time together talking through internal controls and how those are playing into the uniform guidance audit process and go through some maybe best practices for understanding and designing controls specific to your federal awards. So in general, internal controls are just the processes that those charged with governance, management, other employees, uh, the actions that they're taking to provide assurance that an organization is achieving their objectives, that they have reliable financial reporting, and that they're complying with laws and regulations. And so uh, there are the five components that we all learned about in school from the COZO framework, and those also apply in the context of federal awards. So we'll spend a little bit of time going through those as a refresher. The first one we'll talk through, and I would say this is probably the most important, is the control environment. This is really the tone at the top of an organization. It's entity-wide and it's not specific to any department or any one grant. And this is really what sets the foundation for all of the other components of internal control that we'll be talking about. So as part of the audit, um, your auditor will wanna understand, um, you know, does top management, does the governing board understand the risks related to compliance? Are they informed with how the organization is managing compliance obligations? Are the staff who are actually working directly in grant activities and grant management, 
knowledgeable about the compliance requirements for their awards? What's the attitude that the organization has towards audit findings? You know, do they take them seriously? And then you know, lots of general things like, does the organization have a written code of conduct? We've listed here the other four components of internal control. Uh, first, we'll talk through risk assessment, uh, which just like it sounds, it's the process of identifying and managing risks um, relevant to compliance, to reducing fraud, and to achieving in any other type of objective. And so this would really need to be a comprehensive process where you're thinking through internal and external interactions, uh, complexity of your programs, any changes in your program structure or organizational structure, changes in technology, uh, major environmental factors or external factors like a global pandemic. You know, you wanna be thinking through all of these different areas. And that would include assessing fraud risks and thinking through that old fraud triangle of incentive to commit fraud, opportunities to commit fraud, and the attitudes and rationalizations. As you're thinking through award programs, you want to, you'd want to consider the risks for misuse or abuse of funds, embezzlement of those funds, or any type of conflict of interest where they're concerned. And so the results of this risk assessment process are what's used to actually make decisions about information and communication systems and control activities. Um, management from there is gonna design their specific actions and processes to reduce those risks to an acceptable level. The information and communication systems are the actual processes and procedures and records that are capturing information relative to compliance or anything else operational. And so the key here would certainly be to have good, complete, accurate, and valid information coming from those. And this area would really involve a lot of help from an organization's IT team, just as far as the control and process infrastructure, and certainly with respect to information security. From this standpoint, your auditor is going to want to understand the actual reports and information that's used to populate the CEFA or any other type of grant reporting document and what type of processes for reviewing those reports are in place. You'll also want to consider processes for both internal and external communications. The control activities piece is somewhat self explanatory, but it's the actual actions and policies and procedures that make sure that management strategies and directives are actually being executed as planned. As far as the audit goes, your auditor want, will want to make sure that there's up-to-date, well-defined policies and procedures that are written out, uh, especially over grant awards and expenditures, that there's good segregation of duties in these processes, and ideally, there would be a good audit trail that's showing who did what function and when they did it. And then lastly here is monitoring. That's the process of actually assessing how effective your system of internal control is operating. Uh, that should be an ongoing process with some separate evaluations occurring from time to time with either internal or external audits. Um, but in this, Piece, your auditor will want to understand what those monitoring processes are, what's the organization's process for communicating any deficiencies that are noted from the monitoring process, and what's the process for actually remediating them. More specific to the uniform guidance, um, as you're looking at federal programs, your controls need to be the processes that are providing assurance that federal awards are being managed in compliance with laws and regulations and certainly the terms and conditions of the award itself. So the objective here would be to make sure that the award transactions are recorded properly, both in the financial statements and on the CEFA, that the transactions are in compliance with laws and regulations and the terms of the award, that the grant dollars or any assets purchased with those grant dollars 
are safeguarded from misappropriation or embezzlement. And certainly that any reporting that's coming from the CIFA or any other grant reports is reliable and accurate. And so all of this is the responsibility of management under the uniform guidance. Uh, you know, as a term and condition of accepting any federal award, management is already agreeing to maintain a good system of internal control over compliance with their federal awards. So that is management's responsibility to set up this system, to comply with the law, to evaluate compliance with the law and to take action if needed, and then certainly to have good measures to safeguard any type of sensitive or protected information. I think we all know there's several other regulations that uh, govern this, so we won't spend any time with that in our single audit discussion. We recognize that there have been a lot of new challenges for this with uh, the onset of the pandemic. I think we're all aware that there were lots of new awards that were created for COVID relief, um, you know, the provider relief funds being a major one, the coronavirus relief fund, uh, those are kind of the two that come to my mind first, but I know there are several. And a lot of those awards were going to organizations that maybe had never received any federal award funding before, or maybe never enough to actually trigger that uniform guidance audit requirement. And given the pace of everything, especially early on in the, in the pandemic, you know, a lot of these organizations were not able to, you know, in real time have the capacity to actually draft up all of this control over compliance documentation. Uh, so we do understand that uh, that's been a real challenge. Just like any other business process, uh, the shift from having people working in an office to working remotely has also impacted internal controls over compliance. There's been changes in roles and responsibilities uh, with staffing changes. You know, in the beginning of the pandemic, that was probably more related to layoffs and furloughs so that organizations could cut costs. Um, cut to now, I would say that's probably more a function of staffing shortages just to not have the best capacity to be able to perform all of these control activities and monitoring processes the way you might want to. Uh, so we definitely do recognize that that's still presenting a big challenge to lots of organizations. All right, Laura, I'll kick it to you for our third and final polling question. Thank you. Our third polling question is, do you look forward to the single audit process each year? Yes, no, or not sure? Remember, you must fill out the polling question in order to receive CPE credit you will have 30 seconds to answer. Thank you for participating in our poll. Now I'll hand it back over to Catherine. Thank you, Laura. So we've talked through entity level and some kind of general topics related to internal controls over compliance, um, but we'll spend a little bit of time now about talking about how to establish specific controls at the federal award level. So this would be maybe the process that you would go through when your organization is awarded a new grant. While I might argue that the control environment and the tone at the top is probably the most important function of compliance and controls, um, you certainly are required to think through controls at the specific grant level. So the first step to do that would be to identify the actual control objectives. Uh, you'll want to understand the rules and regulations from the grant document or from communications from the awarding agency or to refer back to the compliance supplement to help you understand those objectives to compliance. Typically, the award agreement will indicate a lot of the deadlines and the allowable costs and other requirements, but if there's anything in that awarding information that's not clear, 
uh, the awarding agency uh, should be able to help you with those questions and help you understand. Um, from there, you'll want to understand how the actual grant transactions and potentially the processes for controls are going to actually tie into your current business processes. You'll want to perform a risk assessment to go through all the different scenarios of what could potentially go wrong as it relates to award compliance, and then use that to actually match to control activities that will reduce risks to an acceptable level. Now, you likely already got processes and actions that are in place that can address many of the compliance risks that you've identified, but to the extent that you don't, you may need to implement some new processes and controls and kind of thinking through how to both manage risk, uh, but also you know, process this is that will actually work and fit into your organization, uh, since that can be different for each entity. Uh, once that's been completed, you'll actually place all of these operatives into motion. And then from there, you'll perform ongoing monitoring of the controls to make sure that they're operating the way you've intended them to, that they're effectively reducing risks, and potentially over time, depending on the results of that monitoring, they may need to be adjusted here and there as necessary. A few other things to think about um, as you're documenting and understanding your internal controls. Um, in today's environment, it's very common to outsource business processes to a third party. We'll call that a service organization, and that could be accounting, payroll, grant management, IT, any number of things. And in these instances, management is still retaining responsibility for the processes that are performed by those external organizations. And it's still their responsibility to understand the controls that are in place at the service organization. In a perfect world, those service organizations would obtain what's called a service organization control or a SOC audit and that's where they've the service organization has had an independent auditor come in and issue an opinion on the effectiveness of the internal controls and draft up documentation of what all those controls are uh, that can provide a lot of comfort about the actions that are being taken at a service organization there's also a lot of differences and things to consider based on the size of either your organization or maybe your grant department or your accounting and finance department. You know, certainly regardless of size, you have to have good internal controls, uh, but that can look differently uh, depending on the organization. You know, an organization that's very small has the advantage of having lots of day-to-day -day involvement from top management, uh, but there's definitely some challenges there as far as having good segregation of duties or just overall capacity to perform all of these activities. And so, you know, certainly while there's great benefits to having a strong and robust system of internal control, you can have reduced risk, you have great feedback on how effectively your organization is operating. Um, you certainly wanna do that cost benefit analysis to see what's gonna make the most sense for your organization, for your specific circumstances and for your federal awards. So again, that will look, you know, a little bit differently for everyone. We've listed here some sources of um, reference points for some best practices as it relates to internal control. Um, certainly the compliance supplement that I've mentioned throughout the afternoon, that's going to be a helpful resource with um, control information. Your auditor will be relying on it very heavily um, to help with suggested audit procedures or audit objectives, but it is certainly a tool that the auditee could find use for as well um, with some help on just good practices for controls. The Green Book is the actual control standards that's used by our federal government, so it certainly makes sense to use that as a reference point for setting controls over federal awards. There's the COSO framework that we've mentioned and that we're probably all familiar with. And then depending on the awarding agency, uh, they can also have some helpful best practices and information that they can share 
I say that recognizing that not all agency or sub agency is the same. Uh, some of them are likely going to be more or less helpful than others. So um, certainly recognize that they may not all be as helpful as others. And so the end result of everything that we've talked through as it relates to internal controls would be a nice compliance summary document. And this piece of information would really start with those top level entity-wide controls and then narrow down to the more specific controls for each grant, for each compliance objective, um, to really have a good overarching summary of what type of controls over compliance are in place. And that's going to be a helpful piece of information to have on hand for your own personnel and then certainly for your auditor as well. And so with that, uh, we're coming towards the end of our presentation. I appreciate everyone again for joining us this afternoon. Please don't hesitate to reach out to myself or to Trevor, who will be leading us through part two of this presentation. If there's anything we can help with on single audits or anything else, we'd be happy to do so. I believe we're headed into a five minute break here shortly, but I'll kick it to Laura to help with the logistical details there. Thank you, Catherine. We will now take a short break. The last presentation will begin at 2.15 Eastern. See you then. <laughs>